All right, so we got our last chapter to cover of the semester here, chapter 11. And this is on substitution versus elimination reactions. All right, and these are both reactions that are available to alkyl halides under fairly similar conditions. We're going to see that they're in competition with one another. All right. First, we're going to kind of focus on each one individually, and then we'll talk about like that competition aspect. All right, so these are both types of reactions that we've seen before. So first, let's look at substitution reactions. Okay, and again, we're going to be talking about alkyl halides, so I'm just going to pick a random alkyl halide. If you have your alkyl halide in the presence of a nucleophile, so I'm just going to use generic like nucleophile symbol NU, you're going to get a substitution reaction where that bromine is swapped out for that nucleophile. So in a substitution reaction, our halogen, which we call a leaving group in these reactions, is substituted for a nucleophile. All right, the nucleophile and the halogen swap positions. Okay, and again, importantly, we have a name for the role that that halogen is playing, which is again, this is a leaving group. Okay, so obviously the nucleophile is our nucleophile in this reaction. What's the electrophile in this reaction? The carbon at the base of the halogen. That's what gets attacked by my nucleophile. So this is my electrophile. Cool, so that's a substitution reaction. And again, these are in competition with elimination reactions. So let's take our same alkyl halide. What we're going to see is in an elimination reaction, we form an alkene. All right, and the key here is that in order to form this triple bond, we have to both remove that halogen, our leaving group. But importantly, we also have to remove a hydrogen from the neighboring carbon as well. And so these reactions would not have nucleophiles, but rather specifically a base would be involved, right? Because what is a base? A base is something that accepts hydrogens. Okay, so let's just say in an elimination reaction, that leaving group, that halogen, and a neighboring hydrogen are removed to form an alkene. OK, 
Okay, so we have substitution reactions for alkyl halides where if we have a nucleophile in there, it will swap positions with that leaving group, with that halogen. Or we could have elimination reactions. If we have a base in there, it's gonna pull off a hydrogen in our leaving group and that will leave us with an alkene. All right, so why are these reactions in competition? Why are substitution and elimination in competition? All right, because there's a lot of overlap between the world of nucleophiles and the world of bases. The hydroxide ion, for an example, you would have been first introduced to this in general chemistry because this is a good base. This is the first strong base you ever use in the lab, would be sodium hydroxide, right? We know it's a very good base. Well, this is also a good nucleophile. Right? So there's an, a lot of overlap between things that are both good nucleophiles and good bases. A base is involved in an elimination reaction, and a nucleophile is involved in a substitution reaction. So if we put sodium hydroxide in with our alkyl halide, we're going to get a mixture of these two reactions that occur. Cool, all right, and so we'll talk about that substitution here in, uh, I'm sorry, that competition here in a bit, but now we're just gonna sort of take the rest of this time and focus specifically on the substitution part. So, first things first, let's take an alkyl halide. We're gonna mix it with sodium hydroxide, really just the hydroxide is the important bit. All right, and we want to perform a substitution reaction here. So we're focusing only on the substitution side of things. All right, I'm going to swap out my bromine for that OH. And which element should be bound to my carbon here, the hydrogen or the oxygen? The oxygen, remember, it's the lone pairs on those nucleophiles that are going to be forming your new bond. you got to have a lone pair in order to be a nucleophile. And so indeed, we're going to get this product here. All right, so we can convert an alkyl halide into what new functional group? An alcohol, right? And we're gonna see these substitution reactions. We can create a lot of different functional groups with them. Cool, so hydroxide would be an example of a negatively charged nucleophile. And those absolutely tend to be the best, right? Having a net negative charge makes you very electron rich and that's the property of a nucleophile. All right, so let's do another example here. But now we're going to use a neutral nucleophile So again, I'm going to swap out that leaving group, that chlorine, for my nucleophile. But importantly, if we have a neutral nucleophile, it will lose a hydrogen in this reaction. So I start out with SH2. What actually is bound to my molecule at the end here is just SH. So neutral nucleophiles.
will lose a hydrogen. So then let's do one more here. All right, I'm gonna pick another neutral nucleophile and I want you all to take a second and give me the product of this reaction, NH3. So I don't lose or gain any carbons, so I'm still going to have my four carbons, but now I'm going to swap out that iodine for a, my nucleophile here. But again, since this was a neutral nucleophile, I'm going to remove a hydrogen in the process. All right, and so again, substitution reactions. We can create a lot of different functional groups depending on what nucleophile we use. Right? These are all functional groups we discussed. Alcohols, thiols. Does anybody remember what we call it with the nitrogen? An amine. Right? All different functional groups that we can create with these substitution reactions starting out with alkyl halides. Okay, the other thing that we want to note about these reactants that I chose here, these alkyl halides, was they have different classifications. This first one would be considered a primary alkyl halide because the carbon that's bound to the halogen only has one carbon neighbor. Our second example, this was a secondary alkyl halide because that carbon had one, two carbon neighbors. All right, and so then what do we think the third one is? Our tertiary alkyl halide because the carbon that's bound to the halogen has one, two, three carbon neighbors. All right, and this classification is going to be really important. It turns out that primary alkyl halides react a little bit differently than tertiary alkyl halides. So we want to pay attention to that and make sure you can spy primary, secondary, tertiary. Okay. All right, so this now takes us to our mechanism for our substitution reactions. So let's take a secondary alkyl halide and we're going to take a stereospecific alkyl halide. All right, this would be the R stereoisomer here. If we do a substitution reaction, and I'm going to use our generic nucleophile NU here. Okay, what they found is that you get a stereospecific product. You get one particular stereo, stereoisomer on the product side. Okay, and that stereospecific product had an inversion in its stereochemistry. So I started out with the R, and now I have the S enantiomer. Okay, so we've seen this before, reactions, substitution reactions that flip dashes to wedges or wedges to dashes. 
we say that there is a stereochemical inversion. And again, this was starting out with a secondary alkyl halide. So then they did the same experiment. They were right, all right, well, let's take a tertiary alkyl halide and we're gonna do a very stereospecific reactant, right? So one specific stereoisomer. Everybody take a second and tell me whether we're looking at the R or the S stereoisomer here. All right, finals are right around the corner. Don't let it leave your brain just yet. You need it for a little bit longer here, all right? My bromine is my first priority second, third, and then in the back would be fourth. So now I'm co like connecting these in a counterclockwise way. So which stereoisomer is that? S. S. All right, my lowest priority group is in the back, counterclockwise. So we have the S stereoisomer. So we're starting out with one particular stereoisomer in our flask. We're gonna add our nucleophile. Okay, but what they found is we don't just get one stereoisomer as our product, we get a mixture of both. All right, so that means that this reaction using a tertiary alkyl, uh, alkyl halide, same as before, is not stereospecific. All right, and so remember, anytime you get a mixture of all your possible stereoisomers, you can just represent that using the straight lines. Let me try to shrink this down. All right, so we can make, represent this mixture of these two products here using our straight line bonds. Mm -hmm. All right, so one of these reactions was stereospecific. We got a very particular product, right, using a secondary alkyl halide. Then we did the exact same thing, but with a tertiary alkyl halide. And all of a sudden, it's no longer stereospecific. We get a mixture, a 50-50 mixture of all possible isomers. So what's going on here? It turns out that they, these reactions will proceed. They're the same reaction in terms of bonds broken and bonds formed, all right? But there's a different mechanism. There's a different order to these reactions, depending on what alkyl halide you start out with, all right? Primary and secondary. So we're going to lump these two together, undergo what are called SN2 reactions. That's what we call the mechanism. And tertiary alkyl halides undergo SN1 substitution reactions. All right, so then let's look at each of these more closely, looking at the electron pushing arrows. All right, so let's take a primary, all right,
right? And again, this is our SN2 mechanism. carbon bond and our leaving group is gone. So I want everybody to take a second and identify what bonds are being broken in this reaction and what bonds are being formed in this reaction. I need to break this carbon halogen bond here. And I need to form this new carbon nucleophile bond here. All right, in an SN2 reaction, both of those happen at the exact same time, happen in the same step. All right, so everybody take a second and see if you can't put in your electron pushing arrows that show this new bond being formed and the old bond being broken all in one shot here. So my mechanism, my SN2 mechanism, is my nucleophile is going to do what nucleophiles do and attack that electrophilic site, that carbon, boom. And at the exact same time, in the same step, that bond gets broken between our carbon and our halogen. Okay, so then if I'm being really good here, what would my other product be? And of course we get lazy and we don't bother writing balanced equations, but if I was being good, I'd show my bromide ion over here as well, okay? So in an SN2 mechanism, this mechanism is one step. Bonds formed and broken in the same step. Alright, so then where the heck does that name come from, SN2? Alright, so first of all, the S is because it's a substitution reaction. The N is because we're substituting a nucleophile. Alright, so where's the 2? because there are two molecules involved in the first step. All right, and so that influences the kinetics of the reaction. This would be a binary reaction involved both of those molecules. Um, so that's where the two comes from. Um, a little ask backwards, SN2 happens in just one step, right? Old bonds are broken, new bonds are formed all in one shot for an SN2 mechanism. So then let's draw our free energy diagram for an SN2 mechanism. We 
reaction progress, E energy. All right, and we can just assume that this reaction is exergonic, so our reactant free energy will be higher than our product free energy. And if the entire reaction happens in just one shot here in one step, how many little humps should I have in my diagram? Zero. Just one. Yeah, well, no little divot, right? Oh, just okay. one sort of mound here. <clears throat> Boom. Okay, so this is going to be in contrast to our tertiary alkyl halides, which undergo what we call SN1 mechanisms. All right, so let's take a look at that. So again, now I'm gonna get very similar alkyl halide, but this time a tertiary alkyl halide. Um, let me make it a little bit smaller. I'm not going to really fit. Okay. React it with a nucleophile. And if we look at our products, All right, so let's identify what bonds are being broken and what bonds are being formed. All right, and what we see is pretty much the same as last time, right? I need to break a carbon-halogen bond, and I need to form a new carbon-nucleophile bond. Right, so then how is this mechanism any different from the first one? It doesn't just happen in one step, it happens in two distinct steps. In the first step, the, alcohol, uh, the halogen, the leaving group leaves, right? So this first step, our leaving group leaves, boom, that's step one. Everybody take a second and draw me our intermediate that we would expect if our leaving group leaves. The most common intermediate that we've seen this semester. And what do we call them? Carbocation. And then in the second, whoops, plus, and then in the second step, that's when we have our nucleophile attack. So see if you can't finish off our mechanism here for this reaction. Right, your base of your arrow has to start at a pair of electrons at your nucleophile, the head of the arrow at the electrophile. All right, so what's our, the big difference here is that in an SN1 reaction, it is a two-step mechanism. First, we have the bond breaking. Right, our leaving group leave, and then second, bond formation. So we got two distinct steps here. All right, so then where did the name come from? Again, S is for substitution, and N is for nucleophile. But why is it SN1? Because there's only one molecule in that first step. All right, it's only your alkyl halide that is going to uh, be involved in the very first step of that mechanism. 
And that's the rate limiting step. So it turns out that the kinetics of these reactions only depend on the concentration of your alkyl halide. All right, but it's a little, I don't know, in terms of like me thinking about it, I think about it as being backwards here. An SN2 mechanism has one step. An SN1 mechanism has two steps. So then let's take a second and draw our free energy diagram for these reactions. Again, we can assume it's exergonic, so we're going to put our reactant free energy higher than our product free energy. All right, but take a second and see if you can't fill in what you would expect based on this mechanism that we've outlined here. What's going to be the big difference between this and our SN2 mechanism? We're going to have two little humps on our diagram, right? Because we have this intermediate. So boom, boom. Because this little divot in here represents our carbocation intermediate. Okay, so again, we got to pay attention to the classification of our halogens because these undergo different substitution mechanisms. Primary and secondary halogens undergo SN2 mechanisms where bonds are broken and formed all in one shot, one step, whereas tertiary alcohol, uh, alcohol halides undergo SN1 mechanisms. So it happens in two distinct steps. First, the bond breaks, and then you have your new bond formed. Okay, so looking at this intermediate, why would only tertiary alkyl halides undergo this intermediate, go through this two-step kind of process here? What do we know about carbocations for tertiary, uh, rather tertiary carbocations, good or bad? They're the most stable, right? So primary and secondary aren't going to form those carbocations because they're just less stable, whereas tertiary can form nice, stable tertiary carbocations. All right, well, when we started this discussion of mechanism, we said that it kind of like a big hint was this difference in the stereochemistry that we see. So let's look at how these mechanisms lead to these different stereo uh, specificity properties. So if we do an SN2 here, I'm going to sort of draw this a little differently. Okay, so I have my carbon with my halogen on there. All right. Um, Looking at this carbon here, what's the geometry of these carbons that have these halogens on them? What's the hybridization of that carbon? In ISP2, that'd be a double bond, right? We got four, there are two hydrogens coming off here. SP3s, and so SP3 is tetrahedral. So I'm gonna do my best to try to draw this as accurately in a tetrahedral as I can. We do that where those two bonds are in the same plane. We got one more coming out. Another one kind of pointed back here. Okay. So in our SN2 reaction, our nucleophile is attacking this electrophile in the same step that our leaving group leaves. All right, but importantly, if we think about, right, reactions happen because of collisions. 
it's not going to be able to collide and kick off that leaving group over here or over here. It has to hit it from the opposite side of where that halogen is, right? So it has to attack it from the back in order to kick off that leaving group. All right, and we said that this reaction, this free energy diagram, it's just got one hump, right? What do we call the very tippy top of these humps? The transition states, all right? And remember, those are those weird, like, bond half broken, half formed states, right? So let's take a look here at our transition state. Well, as that nucleophile comes in, this bond is going to be my half formed bond and that halogen bond is going to break at the same time Okay, so then finally when that new bond is fully formed and that on, uh, no, old bond is fully broken, right? now I have my nucleophile and my carbon. But look, those hydrogens can't be pointed towards the nucleophile, right? So now I'm going to have swapped or inverted my molecule here. Right, so now... I draw my tetrahedral as best as I can. I can see that my hydrogens have to be pointed in the opposite direction of where they were originally. Let me shrink this down to one line here. So for our stereochemistry of our SN2 reactions, all right, how do we get this stereospecificity, this inversion of our stereochemistry? Because the nucleophile attacks from the opposite side of that leaving group. Right, it kind of like does that thing that umbrellas do when it's too windy out and you got your nice beautiful umbrella and all of a sudden it's like boom, and it's facing the exact opposite direction. That's exactly what happens to these molecules. Right, the nucleophile comes and attacks from the back and flips that entire molecule. Okay, so we lead, so that leads us to again what we said is our stereochemistry for SN2 reactions, what we call a stereochemical inversion. All right, so then what about our SN1 reactions? We said that these were not stereospecific. All of your possible stereoisomers that you can form are formed. what we call a racemic mixture. All right, so why is that? We've talked about this before. This is actually always the case with our carbocation intermediate reactions. None of them were stereospecific. We had some regiospecific ones. Uh, again, luckily we don't have to worry about that for substitution reactions. But none of them were stereospecific. Why is that? Well, if I draw a carbocation, 
All right, that's about to get attacked by this nucleophile. Remember the geometry of a carbocation with its three bonds and no lone pairs is sp2 hybridized. All right, so it's trigonal planar. Okay, and so the bottom line is carbocations are flat. A nucleophile can attack just as good from one side as it can from the other. In fact, you're going to get 50% of your molecules where the nucleophile attacks on one side and the other 50% of molecules where it attacks the opposite direction. Okay, so we get this racemic mixture. All stereoisomers are formed. Why is that? Because our carbocations are flat. All right, there's no sort of preference in terms of direction in which these uh, nucleophilic attack is going to occur, which is not the case in the SN2 reactions. In the SN2 reactions, the nucleophile can only attack from one direction. Here, because it first forms this flat carbocation intermediate, your nucleophile can attack from both directions, giving you both possible stereoisomer products. Again, what we call a racemic mixture. Cool. All right, so then I'm going to put down some random alkyl halides and some random nucleophiles, and you guys are going to give me the products um, considering what we discussed about stereochemistry. So if there's any specific stereochemistry, you got to draw that as well.
Excuse me. So, my first one here, I have this negatively charged nucleophile. Um, what am I looking at here? Primary, secondary, or tertiary alcohol, uh, alkyl halide? So this one's primary, because it's got one carbon neighbor. So then what would be our mechanism here? SN2 or SN1? SN2. Now, it actually really doesn't matter for primary. You don't ever have to worry about stereochemistry for a primary alkyl halide because there's already two hydrogens on that carbon just by definition, so you, you can't have a stereo center. Okay, so that's kind of best case scenario here. Don't have to worry about dashes and wedges. Since we have a negative nucleophile, we're just gonna attach it, not remove any hydrogens. Right, we just have that lone pair becoming our bonding pair. All right, so now our next example, primary, secondary, tertiary. So this one's now secondary, all right, because it has one, two carbon neighbors. So this is also an SN2 mechanism. So that means that I have to have my inverted stereochemistry in my product. All right, or what was a dashed bond is now going to be a wedged bond. Okay. Um, this is what's called and we're going to see this guy kind of a lot it's one of a it's one of a very good nucleophile this is what's called a cyanide ion okay note that the negative charge is on the carbon so that's what's going to be attached to our new molecule here not the nitrogen Okay, and the name of that ion is a cyanide ion, but in organic chemistry, we would call this molecule a nitrile, and you hear those sort of synonymously with one another, all right? This isn't really something I'm gonna quiz you on, but just FYI, you're gonna hear both of these kind of interchangeably. And the other way I would draw this if I was in my homework system, because I can't just write CN in my homework system, I have to draw the carbon-nitrogen triple bond. All right, so I would have my carbon is on the other end of that wedge, and then I explicitly draw my triple bond to that nitrogen. And then my last alkyl halide is what? Primary, secondary, or tertiary? So now we got a tertiary alkyl halide, which means that we have an SN1 mechanism. So do I got to worry about dashes and wedges in my product? No. We're going to get both possible products here. So I can just represent that, my stereochemically ambiguous product, with straight lines for my bond. Okay, now this is a neutral nucleophile here. Which atom in this CH3OH is actually going to be bound to my carbon in my product? The oxygen, this is very important. If you drew your product CH3OH, something like that, that would be wrong. It is specifically the oxygen that is bonded to, that, uh, to my new carbon, or rather to the carbon, my electrophilic carbon. And so you could represent your CH3 group coming off of it with a straight line. That's what you'd have to do in your homework system. You'll also see these represented just OCH3 
That's kind of a shorthand. I like my bond line structures. Okay, and again, because this was a neutral nucleophile, I lose that hydrogen when I attach it to my new molecule, to my product. Uh, does anybody remember what this functional group is called here? When you have an oxygen, but it doesn't have a hydrogen on one side, it has carbons on either side. We're a pretty forgettable functional group here. These are ethers. Okay, so again, we can create a wide variety of different functional groups with our substitution reactions. All right, so just two more sort of things to tack on to our discussion of substitution reactions. Talked about mechanisms, all right? Now we're gonna talk about those leaving groups, those halogens. It turns out that some alkyl halides are better than others when it comes to substitution reactions. Okay, so to be clear, anytime we have a substitution reaction, so I'm just gonna create sort of variable spot here, add in my nucleophile, I substitute out whatever that X is for my nucleophile, that thing that I'm swapping out, we call a leaving group. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a list of our leaving groups from the worst leaving groups to the best leaving groups. So let's look at our halogens and let's just take like the two extremes here from either end of our column. On the one hand, we have a fluoride ion. And on the other end, we have an iodide ion. When we were talking about acids and bases, we talked about the difference in stability between these ions here, right? Remember what made a strong acid a really good acid was that its conjugate base was nice and stable. One of these will is the conjugate base of a very strong acid, and the other one is the conjugate base of a weak acid. Which one's which here? Which one is more stable, fluoride or iodide? It's actually not fluoride, because fluoride's so small. And so if it has that negative charge, that electron density is packed into this tiny little area. The larger an ion is, the better able it is to spread that charge out, making it nice and stable. And we see the same trend when we're talking about leading groups. So iodide is the best leading group. Fluoride is a terrible leading group. And our chlorine and our bromine sit in the middle, again, in order of size here. Okay. So an alkyl iodide is going to be the best leaving group, followed by bromine, followed by chlorine. We're going to say in a distant fourth is fluoride. All right, and even worse than that would be a hydroxide leaving group, HO. Again, we can use the same argument we did in our acids and bases chapter. Fluorine is more electronegative than oxygen, so it's a little bit happier to have that negative charge. And we're not really talking about this functional group much, but what type of functional group would have a hydroxide leaving group? If I went up and swapped out for my X here, OH, what functional group would I be looking at? 
holy hell. I'm gonna put an OH in the place of X, an alcohol, all right? So alcohols have the worst leaving group. Or pretty terrible. Okay, now, a lot of y'all who are in the lab component of the course are like, what the hell are you talking about? We literally have been doing substitution reactions with alcohols for the past like three weeks now. What are you talking about? Okay, but remember what we have to do in order to get that substitution reaction to occur is we have to use ridiculously concentrated acid and we gotta heat the crap out of the thing, right? So we have to use what we would consider to be very harsh conditions in order to get that reaction to occur. Uh, we will talk about alcohols exclusive, or you know, like in detail next chapter. But one of the ways that you make this into a much better leaving group is by adding acid, and that's how we are able to do it in the lab, right? By adding that concentrated um, sulfuric acid. Usually, that's the one way that we can turn a terrible leaving group, the hydroxyl group, into a better leaving. All right, but suffice it to say that the focus of our chapter in these substitution reactions are our alkyl halides for a reason, because they're really good leaving groups. And just like always, we're gonna kind of lump chlorine, bromine, and iodine together and ignore fluorine, because it's a terrible leaving group among the bunch. Okay, so in terms of our leaving groups here, again, the big iodide is the best and our fluoride is the worst. Okay, and then the last thing we're gonna talk about with respect to these substitution reactions is solvent choice. All right, we're gonna take all of our solvents and we're gonna lump them into two bins, all of our polar solvents really. We need to have a polar solvent for this to work um, because nucleophiles are just polar, they have to be right, because of that imbalance of charges. Okay, so our solvent choice, we're gonna have two bins here. The first bin are what we call polar protic solvents. All right, a polar protic solvent is a solvent that contains either an oxygen hydrogen or a nitrogen hydrogen bond. Protic meaning proton, right? The hydrogen there. So some examples of polar protic solvents would be water, any sort of an alcohol, like methanol, ammonia, right? Anything that contains an oxygen, hydrogen, or nitrogen, hydrogen bond. And we're gonna throw all of these polar protic solvents into one bin because these are the solvents that are capable of what type of intermolecular interaction? If you have an oxygen hydrogen or a nitrogen hydrogen, what type of interactions can they have? Hydrogen bonding, right? So these are our solvents that are capable of hydrogen bonding. And is hydrogen bonding a strong or a weak type of intermolecular interaction? It's on the stronger end of things, right? So we're gonna say a relatively strong intermolecular force, IMF. All right, so that's one bit for our solvent molecules, things that can hydrogen bond. All right, the other bin, again, it has to be polar, but these are what are called aprotic solvents. They're polar, so they have to contain a dipole but not one of those OH 
or NH types. So a protic, meaning there is not a proton. Like atypical means it's not typical. Some examples. Uh, we would know about one of the ones that we use just all the time in the lab would be acetone. All right, acetone is a polar molecule because it's got that carbon-oxygen double bond. But it is not capable of hydrogen bonding. Okay, another really common one is what's called DMSO, which is very similar to acetone, but instead of having a carbon in the middle, it's a sulfur. So it's an oxygen sulfur double bond, and then these two methyl groups sticking off. These are both very common polar aprotic solvents used in these type of experiments. They're still nice and polar, but they do not have any uh, OH or NH bonds, which then of course means that they cannot hydrogen bond. Only dipole dipole. All right, so in the context of our substitution reactions, what, like, what is the difference between these two solvents here? Polar protic versus polar aprotic, how is that gonna have an effect on things? Okay, well let's just look here at some of our nucleophiles, right? A common feature of all nucleophiles is that they have this electron density, right? They are electron rich species. That's what it means to be a nucleophile, right? The best nucleophiles have that net negative charge, okay? So when we have a polar protic solvent that can hydrogen bond, right? Those relatively strong type of intermolecular forces, this will stabilize that electron rich nucleophile. All right? Stabilize it because it can form those hydrogen bonding interactions. I mean, if it's a, a negatively charged one, it can even do like dipole ion interactions, right? Nice stable interactions with that electron rich nucleophile. If you have a polar aprotic solvent, it's still polar, it's still kind of doing its best job, but it just simply cannot stabilize the nucleophile as well. It's going to form much weaker interactions with its dipoles, not those nice, strong hydrogen bonding interactions. All right, so then which one would be better if we were trying to do a substitution reaction? Let's think about this in terms of our free energy diagrams. We're going to make a free energy diagram. So again, we, are, we can just go ahead and assume that this is an exergonic reaction. So I'm going to have my reactants at a higher energy level than my products. Okay. And so in blue here, I'm going to do a protic solvent 
we can just do SN1 re our SN2 reaction to make our life a little easier. We just got one sort of hump here. Okay, and remember, on the left-hand side, this is the energy of my reactants. And on the right-hand side is the energy of my products. So now if we drew an aprotic solvents free energy diagram, the same reaction happening in an aprotic solvent. All right, how is this going to differ? Okay, I will tell you that the free energy of the product side won't really change much. But if we said, as we did say, that our product A, uh, I'm sorry, our polar A product solvent cannot stabilize the nucleophile as well. Well, first of all, what's the nucleophile? A reactant or a product? Reactant. It's one of our reactant. And if it's less stable in this aprotic solvent, am I going to draw this line up here or down here? Which represents less stability? Higher energy is less stable. All right? And so what we see here our free energy diagram illustrates is that substitution reactions are more favorable in aprotic solvents than protic solvents. Okay, and this is going to be something that we want to think about when we start discussing this competition between substitution and elimination reactions. I, if I have a reaction that's favoring on elimination products, I can just go and change it and carry it out in a product solvent, and that will help favor that substitution product because it'll destabilize my nucleophile. Um, and again, I guess just to illustrate here, right, my delta G for this red reaction is much greater than the delta G for the blue reaction. Okay, and so I don't know, it's kind of a normal way to think about reactions is being made more favorable by stabilizing the products, by making a nice stable product we can also make a reaction more favorable by destabilizing the reactants, right? Having higher free energy on the reactant side will lead to a larger delta G for that reaction. All right? Cool. So just to kind of review here, we got these two types of reactions that are in competition with one another, substitution and elimination reactions. Substitution reactions, you're swapping out your leaving group for a nucleophile. Elimination reactions, you're uh, creating an alkene. And then we spent most of the day just discussing these substitution reactions in detail, both the differences between the mechanisms that you see, which lead to different products, uh, as well, which lead to different products, as well as the effects of the leaving group choice and the choice of solvent. Cool. Awesome.